diversity of sessions, there are seven sessions um, that really speak to each other. And just this morning, we had uh, UNICEF that you know hosted a session on country-led monitoring, where we learned about participatory approaches to strengthen national uh, monitoring systems, and then uh, the work uh, in Uganda to monitor SDG 6.2 and how they adapted their system. And, and anyway, each of these sessions is linking to each other. Here we'll be talking about, well anyway, I won't, I won't introduce the session, but I think we'll be speaking to also the SDG you know, monitoring at, on some level. So I think that will speak to it. And also, <clears throat> then in, throughout the week, we have a few more sessions. We have two more sessions uh, tomorrow. So I just wanna let you know what the, those are. In the morning at 11.30, we have uh, Achieving Universal Access to Washington Schools with Innovative m and in Africa and beyond. And that's uh, with JMP and uh, GIZ, who have invited also a few different countries to share their experiences of uh, wa doing Washington Schools. And we also have Accelerating Sanitation Access Through Mobile IT, lessons from using data uh, to develop sanitation uh, products, or well, markets, products, and services. And that'll be from 2 to 3 uh, p.m. And that's with the Mobile Operators Association, G GSMA, and uh, the Container-Based Sanitation Alliance. Um, then on Friday, we'll continue and we'll have a session at 10.30 on monitoring hygiene behavior change uh, with the experiences of water aid working with government uh, to do that. And at one o'clock, we'll, we'll have one on using CLTS and post ODF data for monitoring country proce uh, progress. And finally, I'm also quite excited about the final session, which will be at 3 p.m. on the Friday, which is really about rapid, uh, rapid action uh, learning and research. So really, you know, if we get, for example, a movement with the level of political um, leadership that, for example, was demonstrated in India, how do you make sure that, you know, your, when your sanitation systems are replaced, but then how do you actually make sure that you keep learning when you're working at that rate and it's not just everybody reporting progress. So, I'm gonna hand over the session. One minute into the session, I think. That's all right. Thank you. Hello, is this working? Yes, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eddie Perez, and I'm coming from the United States. I work with uh, a, a US NGO called Global Communities, and I've been asked to chair this session. Before we start, just briefly to give you a, a little bit of a focus, um, the, the, the sub-theme for this specific session under the broader theme of monitoring and using evidence to improve hygiene and sanitation is Measuring the last mile, assessing new equity and sustainability data across African countries. I like to summarize by saying, leaving no one behind. And so hopefully this session will give us some good insight and some tools and some insight on how do we know if we're leaving someone behind and if we are leaving them, what are we going to do about it? Actually, I don't think we're gonna get into the second part. It's more about monitoring so that we know whether we're achieving the equity that we've all committed to. The structure of the uh, session is we will have two uh, presentations. This whole session has been organized by the Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council. Uh, so we will have two presentations, of uh, each one of about 15 or 20 minutes uh, by our colleagues from the Collaborative Council. I'll introduce them in one second. And then we will go have a panel of distinguished panelists they're distinguished as well, but <laughs> uh, where we will continue the theme and the discussion about monitoring for equity and sustainability. And I will kind of try to monitor or chair that discussion with them. And then hopefully we'll have about 10 minutes or so left at the end for some questions, okay? So uh, without further ado, I want to bring um, Caroline uh, Vandervoorden, I apologize, I'm butchering the name, who is the head of the technical support unit at the Collaborative Council. So.
Right, let me figure this out. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, like, uh, like I already mentioned, um, I'm with the Collaborative Council. We run uh, the Global Sanitation Fund and have, recent, have been working on devising a new outcome survey methodology uh, that inspired this session. So what I'll be looking at in my, in my presentation, I'll give you a little bit of background, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the evaluation framework and the objectives of what, what we were trying to do, and then actually go into some of the results that we feel will then give some nice food for thought for the next presentations as well. So we established the Global Sanitation Fund in 2008. Uh, it's a fund that finances program, programs focusing very much on collective and collaborative uh, behavior change, um, targeting the last mile. Uh, we had baseline surveys done for all these programs in the beginning. They were done by the executing agencies. They varied in methodology, they varied to a certain extent in quality, and it made it hard for us to, uh, to have a real comparative, good com comparison base. Uh, so we, in 2017, started work with the University at Buffalo, uh, Pavani Ram's group, to develop a new outcome survey methodology that would give us more scope to, to, to learn uh, and to compare across programs as well. And the emphasis on this is very much on measuring equity and social norm outcomes. And I'll talk more about that later. So briefly, um, what most programs, sanitation programs seek? We seek access. Do people actually have access to the toilet? We also seek use. Are they using those toilets? What most sanitation programs measure, I would argue, is access and maybe a little bit of use, because it's much harder to measure the use uh, over time. So what we in CL programs that are based on CLTS, on community-led total sanitation, uh, are trying to achieve is, is open defecation-free status. That goes even beyond both use and, and access, because it's not just about what one household does. It's about what everybody in the community does. So it adds another layer of complication to how you would measure that. Now, you need a theory of change for a CLTS intervention. Um, you know, quite often we are asked, I think many practitioners in the council, to, um, to talk about the health impact of our interventions. We don't necessarily think that it's a very reasonable question. Um, we would like to argue that we focus on the intervention to see if the intervention actually changes people's behavior. Health impact is much further. And, you know, that's step one. Then there will be two, three, four, five. And then you might get to, you know, health impact. That bit in the middle isn't very well defined very often. Um, and so what we try to do here is to develop a theory of change for the evaluation framework of our programs. So just talking you through this very briefly, um, you've got your CLTS program exposure. Are people actually participating in? Are they being touched by the interventions in their village, uh, in their community? Which then leads ideally to individual and household level actions um, around improving their ownership uh, and access to latrines and building, or constructing, or, or improving, whatever it may be. Um, but at the same time, CLTS tries to change the social norm. There is a social influence. That's the whole point of CLTS, right? This is all about you, no, you not eating your neighbor's feces and the other way around. Um, so between those two, uh, the individual actions and the social influences, we hope to change behavior as well as access. And all that together, ideally, then changes habits uh, leads to more equity and hopefully gives people user satisfaction. So we wanted to be able to measure each and every box in this framework, and that's what the outcome survey does. I'm not going through all that today, um, but we have measures in the survey tools for all of those. What we're focusing mainly now is these four things, describing the key sanitation and hygiene outcomes um, of the Global Sanitation Fund uh, in the, the study households and the public facilities, uh, describing the emerging process and outcome indicators around social norms and habit creation and satisfaction, um, and then focusing very much on, on equity and non-discrimination issues and assessing the sustainability of the open deprivation free status among these verified communities. That was the, the summary of what this outcome survey was about. All the surveys are based on, on cross-sectional data collection and uh, multi-stage cluster sampling. Um, 
there are different data collection sites. They all include household surveys. They all look at schools, health facilities, and communities. Um, they are all using a mix of uh, structured interviews, uh, census and, and, and openification or latrine use behaviors, um, visual inspections, as well as structured observation uh, in a subset of households. And these data collection tools are somewhat contextual contextualized to country, but we're trying to make sure that they are uh, as, as similar as possible in order for us to allow to compare across countries as well. So just to give you a, a sense of what I'm presenting today, I'm looking at some data from three countries, Malawi, Tanzania, and Kenya. They, they, they were the first three countries that we ran this survey in. Uh, more data from other countries is underway. Um, and Tanzania and Kenya are, uh, the reports are still in draft, so we don't have the reports out yet, but the data is, uh, has been more or less analyzed by now. Um, so just to give you a sense, we had questionnaires for the, for the household head and then a separate questionnaire for a female caregiver. In quite a few households, those, are, those turned out to be the same people. Um, and so you can also see that the gender of the household survey, household head survey respondents was, was uh, more female than male. And the age groups are more or less similar across the, the three countries as well. First, the first step in that theory of change was looking at the exposure to the actual program activities. Um, keeping in mind that this survey is looking at, is going back to villages that have been intervened in anything between three years ago, one, two year, one year ago, uh, some of them even a little bit longer than that. So it's a range of, uh, of recall time, if you like. Um, and you see that as well. Um, this is data that's very important for a program to think about the actual quality of its interventions. Um, some of this is about recall, and you know, people may have forgotten that they actually did a transact walk, and some of this is about CLTS being you know, different. In it. It's up to the CLTS facilitator whether they would use each and every tool in their toolbox, so they might not always do their transact walks, et cetera. But it gives a sense of how many people you know, were, were part of or could, re could recall that they were part of, a, of an intervention. Um, Another thing we looked at was, and which was very important for us, was the activity exposure of men versus women. Um, and what this data shows you is that actually it's, it's not, that, not that different in Malawi. In, in Tanzania, there was a slightly uh, bigger difference. This is a score. Because we looked at different things that said, you know, that measured exposure, things like did you do the transact walk? Can you recall being in a meeting? Did someone come to your village? If you put all those together, you could get a score. Uh, from, from zero to four, and so uh, in Malawi, you know, the people, most people scored four, so um, mo people were more, more exposed in Tanzania. They were on the one, two, two, so they, they could recall some interventions or some uh, activities, but not all. So some findings from these, from these, these surveys. Looking first at the, the first outcome around actual key sanitation and hygiene outcomes. So this is about access to sanitation services. This is looking, this is dividing it by health quintile. And so, and the black lines are from the original baselines. Now, like I said, the baselines were done somewhat differently and so aren't 100% comparable, but they give you an idea of, of where villages or where the programs were before and where they are now. Um, so what it shows is that uh, in Kenya, in Malawi, sorry, we have, quite high access, but it's very much in the un unimproved type of facility. Um, whereas in, in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, people have definitely have access now to improved and safely managed. We've bulked this together because, especially in Kenya, we actually had a lot of data sh uh, implying safely managed. We need to do further analysis to really be sure that that's the case, um, but it's at least definitely improved. Um, and so what's interesting to see is that uh, with, a, with a small uh, exception in Kenya for the lowest quintile, there is a relatively uh, equal access across, across the wealth quintiles. Um, then we looked again at women's exposure to program activities uh, versus their level of household decision making, because the hypothesis being the more they're exposed to the process, the more they might also uh, be able to influence the decision-making. Um, 
And so the blue lines are the involvement in their type of latrine being built and the involvement in, the, in locating the latrine. And one, two, three, four are those scores of exposure. So you could say for Malawi that the more they were exposed, uh, the more they also had uh, influence on involvement in the type of latrine being built and, and the, 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 where the latrine was going to be. Another example from Malawi was about uh, women's exposure versus decision making uh, about not being exposed at all to, to being exposed uh, to one, two, or three of the, of the levels. And so again, it showed that there does seem to be some relation between those two. I might skip a few because I'm aware that we want to, to move on for discussion as well. So looking at some of the social norms. Now, the logic here, I think this isn't new to many people because many of our, of our partners have been looking into measuring this as well, and it's, it's very much based on the framework by, by, by Bicheri, um, is that there are personal normative beliefs. Um, what do I think I should be doing? There are empirical expectations. What do I think you're doing? And there are normative expectations. What do I think you think I should be doing? So the empirical expectations, uh, I see most people practicing this behavior um, look like this for these three countries. Um, on the question, neighbors regularly defecate in the open, um, both in Malawi uh, and in Kenya, the majority of people would say no, none of them. Uh, Tanzania, it's more halfway. So this implies that in Tanzania there's, there's less of an empirical expectation than there is in the other two. Similarly, how many of your neighbors use a toilet? Um, in Malawi and Kenya, all of them was definitely the, the higher answer. In Tanzania, a bit less so. Looking at the normative expectations, other people care strongly about me practicing this behavior. Um, it's, a, it's a similar picture. Uh, where do your neighbors think you should defecate? That's pretty much across the board. Everybody knows what the answer to that question is, or at least what <laughs> down to date they give. Uh, so that's very close to 100%. Um, but then, uh, how many neighbors would agree with the statement, it's fine for everybody to defecate in the open? There's some difference, again, between Malawi, Kenya on the one side and Tanzania on the other. Uh, and then the other question was added. Malawi was the first outcome survey we did. We then changed it a bit later on. So the, we added a question there, which was around, if a new family moved in uh, and wished to build a latrine but couldn't afford it, how would people react to that? And that question for Tanzania and Kenya um, showed that across, you know, there were, there was willingness to help these people, but a bit more so in Kenya than in, in Tanzania. Um, this is another way of looking at the normative expectations, uh, lo looking at the scores, basically the, the smaller that, that uh, squiggly is, the better, the better the score has been. Uh, established, the better the norm has been established. And so in Malawi and, and, and Kenya, slightly less, so a fairly high norm was established in, in Tanzania, we found less of that. Um, similarly, with self-reported, so I'll go through that. Another thing to look at was about caregiver satisfaction, because for us, an outcome has to be whether this is a service that people are happy to use. Um, and so again, the caregivers were the questionnaires that were addressed at women uh, with at least one child uh, under five versus the head, house, head of household, uh, which uh, could be separate, could be different. So generally, we could say there were quite high levels of satisfaction, um, but there was an issue there around, uh, around cleanliness um, in Tanzania, and uh, we, we've, that was one of those issues that we then brought to the program and said, well, okay, why is that? Um, then, looking a little bit at access to hand washing facilities, and I can do this quite quick because uh, anybody who's a sanitation practitioner would expect <laughs> this picture, unfortunately. Um, these are CLTS programs. They have all done hand washing promotion as part of those programs, but they all show uh, that there's still a way to go uh, on, on hand washing facilities. Um, so in blue, there's no facility, and in, in orange, it's limited. And, uh, and gray basic. So you can see that Kenya has, has made some, different pro some, some good progress here, uh, but there you also do see that people in the higher wealth quintile 
have more access than people in the, the lowest quintiles. We also looked at the hand washing norms, just as we did for sanitation and using a toilet. We asked the same questions around, would you expect to wash your hands? Would you expect others to wash your hands, etc.? cetera? Uh, similarly to, to the slide before, the norm is lower than it is for, for uh, latrine use, which was to be expected. Um, and then we did structured observations, and they showed uh, this picture. <laughs> it's not great. Um, we know that there is some hand washing, and, and here actually Tanzania um, again lays out a little bit from the others. Um, there is some hand washing, but, but definitely with soap uh, is, um, is a lot lower than, than with water only. So then looking at some of the equity and non-discrimination data that we, that, we, that we had, and there are many different ways in which we are looking at that. We're looking at the gender and, and wealth. Uh, angles, and th those I've shown in some of the previous slides, education, uh, subnational, by, by region, by district, uh, by age, but also by mobility and or other visual limitations. And so I'm just giving a few examples here of the type of data we we found. Um, this one is about, also from Malawi, about latrine access to different categories of household members by household wealth. Um, and we found this very interesting and striking, and we, this was again one of those findings we brought back to the, to the program because we didn't quite understand why this happened. But girls across all health quintiles consistently we seem to have, were felt to have lower access, um, less or more restricted access than the other people in their, uh, in their households, uh, than, than boys, men, and women. This one is then, the similar uh, measure from the other, from Tanzania and Kenya, where there's much less of a difference between boys, girls, men and women. This is about sanitation services in schools, um, where, uh, where Kenya runs ahead of it um, on, on Tanzania and Malawi. Um, and this one was a, a different measure looking at accessibility and safety for students with limited mobility. And so these were measures around, is the seat raised? Uh, can the door open with minimal difference? Does the door open outwards, which is important when you're uh, not so mobile? Um, is there a clear path from building to the toilet? And that was actually a measure that we found in many, ma very many places. Um, but for example, is the door wide enough for a wheelchair? That was uh, a measure that you know, that was only the case in, in, in a few schools. Now, looking a little bit at sustainability, um, one of the core things we're interested in with these outcome surveys. Again, data from the three countries, looking at the percentage of households adhering to national ODF criteria. Um, this is also, here it matters, um, very much how you, how you measure ODF. And so this is based on national ODF criteria, which do differ quite a bit between these three countries. Um, Malawi has, uh, has a, quite a, a high number of criteria, or, uh, things that make up the ODF standard together, um, and they are a bit different from some of the other countries. So for them, for example, privacy is a measure in there, uh, but the between the quality is not, in that it doesn't necessarily have to be an improved toilet, it just has to be a toilet. Um, but adherence across quintiles is pretty much similar. Then adherence to national ODF criteria, this is, again, this is Malawi data, um, which shows you that the, you know, the, the core, if you like, criteria of ODF, which is there's no feces in the open, was observed, was very high. But the, um, the privacy and the sanitation facility access measures were somewhat lower. Um, so the, the behavior of not doing it in the open was very much sustained, but the quality of the latrines uh, was definitely failing, were falling back. So these were just some measures. There's much more, and like I said, we are expecting data uh, from Senegal, Togo, Nigeria, and Benin to come in as well. So we are growing this, this database of, of data we have, this, 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 this wealth of knowledge. There are many different ways in which we can use this and analyze it. These were just some of the first 
findings. So at this point in time, you know, there's no, no sweeping conclusions yet. Uh, we are very interested uh, to see if we can learn more about the correlation between the social norms and the sustainability of the ODF. You know, the, the, the hypothesis being that if there's a stronger norm, then the likelihood of these behaviors being sustained uh, is, is higher. But we need more uh, of the data to really see if we can prove that, if you like. Um, Similarly, and then, is there a threshold in terms of what norms needs to be achieved? Um, and what of this could potentially be used to influence common metrics and, uh, and methodology for governments and sector partners? So those are some of the questions I think we'll come back to uh, in the next phase of the session as well. Yeah, well, I, 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 because I don't want to take too much time for discussion now, but if there are any particular questions for clarification, I'm happy to, to take those now. Otherwise, we can talk more later as well. to the next, sorry, let me just see if I can set this up for. Is someone out there setting this up for the next speaker? <laughs> My presentation magically appeared earlier. I don't know how the next one will come. Um, sorry, you've got a question, yes. Yeah, sorry, there was a question here, so, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Atta Benson. I'm the National Coordinator of uh, the Society Network on Water and Sanitation. And Caroline, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's given us situations in the different countries. But is it possible you give us, you give us the situation in rural and urban setup to enable us to see which one is easier to, to achieve or to manage. I don't know if you have a such, um, such data. Um, rural coverage and achievement in the rural sector, rural area, as well as um, right. the coverage yeah. and um, achievement in the urban sector. I don't know if you have um, such data. Y so yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. Cool. Hi, thanks for that. There was one of the quest one of the things you said is that when asked if households, if new households moved in, and you gave two options, one was they didn't care, and the other option was they'd help them build a toilet. I wondered what the other questions were what the yeah what the, the other responses were one more mm. question okay last one for now uh, thank you so much for the question, uh, presentation the recent recent studies shows that access to water was uh, associated with odf sustainability uh, in your study there was such a observation Okay, um, so thanks, thanks very much. Um, so this is a, these programs, sorry, the programs funded by the Global Sanitation Fund are all rural programs. So all this data is all about rural sanitation programming. So from this, I can't say anything about the compression between, between rural and urban because that wasn't, we, there wasn't any scope for these. Um, in terms of the, the norm and, and what, would, what would they do if new households moved in, there were questions around what you would expect from them. Would you expect new households to adhere to the same behavior? And then there were questions about what would you actually do, would you be willing to help those households? So there were different questions. And then again, there's always questions, in a way, the same questions being asked in different ways because you're trying to, be, to, to see if they're consistent in their answers. Um, so there is, a, there is a whole set of questions there, um, but focusing mainly on those two. Size. And then in terms of access to water, yes, I do uh, think we, and uh, it's not in this presentation, but I do think we're starting to find the correlation between, uh, because obviously in the household questions, we are asking questions and we are observing what their situation is, what their access to water is. And there does seem to be uh, a body there, but we, 
because this is early days on these data, we need to do more analysis, but I, I, I feel from what we've seen so far that it might very well support that, that finding. So, thank you. So let me, <laughs> let me uh, move you on. So we were presenting here data from, from three countries, um, and you know, the way I presented it now, it was almost like there was a judgment there about one country doing less than the others. It wasn't so much about that, it was more to show how we are starting to see trends across. Um, but the country uh, that came out here as having potentially some challenges was, was Tanzania. And we actually have uh, the m and &E officer from the Tanzania program, the Tanzania GSF supported program called the UMATA program with us, uh, Joyce Masili from Plan International. And so she will present now a bit on what this outcome survey meant and how this, how this, uh, how this uh, was received by, uh, by the program from their side. So that's the next presentation. Except for, I don't know how to get the next presentation. Oh, is he? Oh, there we go. Done. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Joyce, as it is presented um, in the floor. I'm going to share the experience on the outcome survey that was recently conducted in uh, last year. Though the report has not been shared uh, to all other partners, it is under review. But the findings that has come out of this uh, survey has the meaning to the program and even the meaning to this platform to take on and it can help on thinking on so much on monitoring and evaluation perspective. So my presentation is going to cover okay so my presentation's outlines is going to tell a little bit about the overview of the program so you might know. Like my colleague said, the GSF program is, uh, is supporting the rural uh, areas and in our program we are doing it in, in a three district councils. So I'll define to you the, when we say the district to our country, how big it is and the size when I say the villages and in comparing to the national level so that we can be able to capture well. The program goal and targets, approaches and definition in summary. Then I will, I will pick out the small lessons from the process of all outcome survey, the tools that were used, the analysis that took place and even the key lessons and actions that the program is taking on and we are thinking and we are working on it and the way we are influencing the national to change and to abide to the changes. So uh, looking at our key indicators, at the light hand side we see that is where we want our program to, to reach, to be ODF. And when we say ODF, we mean, we mean every household to have its own latrine, to live in a clean environment, to, to access to the hand washing facilities and everything. So that's where the dream of the program and JSF and WSCC is. But we have the key four, I mean, key, four key indicators that we are working on. We, we look on the ODF and the ODF in my country, as per standard, we have the national ODF protocol, whether it's rural or it's urban, it is used the same and it measures and it has two levels, the level two and the level one. As the level two is the minimum level, which is that and using on the, I mean, checking on the basic sanitation and the higher level is the level one, whereby every household needs to have the improved latrines. We have not yet achieved any ODF level one, uh, meaning that to all of the household to have the improved sanitation, but we are, uh, doing much better in the level two, at least the basic sanitation. But if you look to the targets, I, I've highlighted this because it's important. If you look to the targets, the number of villages, 
The program is covering 170 villages out of 269 in the program district, and, uh, which is almost 63%, and the reflected population as well. But if you look to the indicator of improved, you will see it is lower compared to what is achieved on ODF. This is because of the definitions I've shared with you and the definition of improved, which I would like also to highlight a bit. The improved in, a, in our context in Tanzania, it is not aligned with JMP. It is of higher standard, like it's take, it, has, it must have the good structure, the wall, uh, it checks the roof, it checks the washing slab, and it checks the, the doors as well, so which is a, a, a little bit higher standard as per JMP. And uh, as per village, the size, at nationwide we have 15,000 villages. The program is working on 170 villages out of 269 in the program districts. So, and one village has the size of 2,000, I mean 2,000 people up to, up to 4,000 size per village and size as per households, it has uh, 160, the minimum, up to five, I mean 500 to 2,000 up to 3,001 village. So the size are big. What? Okay. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, it's not. Okay, so uh, I'll share a little bit. So a little bit on outcome survey process. So like my colleague has said, we had a, uh, a, 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 a lot of tools and which were trying, most of them looking at use and access. And uh, those tools were a, a many reaching different groups. So one of the things that I can share with you was the number of the research assistant when you are thinking as for our fellows Nigerians in Benin who are expecting to conduct this. So they will have to think of the number of research assistant to allow to work on the tools because one tool can, uh, uh, our experience was taking minimum of 45 minutes. So it will need more research assistant to cover all the tools. If one research assistant is working on all the tools, sometimes the, the results are compromising as they get tired, they are also human being. So that needs to be taken into consideration. Also, because of the insight and the context of those tools, they are very, uh, I mean, deep, and they are checking a lot of things, so the days, the number of days to train those research assistant need to be clearly specified and need to be allocated to us. It was done within two days, which was not effective and was not uh, very good, and there was so many backstopping between the, the research assistant, the Plan International, and the WSCC as well. So to avoid that coming back and forth, that needs to be planned well, and it, is, it can work very nice. Likewise to the training and piloting of the tools. The days we had as for in Tanzania, it, we, we used two days, which was not effect, I mean, effective compared to number of tools and number of the areas that the tools were trying to address. And uh, the, likewise, it has the effect on the results that can be given out. But one thing that uh, was very good in this uh, tools, methodology, approaches. It was the collaboration between Plan International, University of Buffalo, and WSCC. This was, was good in terms of technical support and in terms of knowledge because of diverse, uh, I mean diversity in knowledge and capacity. So this was very good, and uh, I will encourage that to be done even to other countries. Uh, sharing and the utilization of the findings Yes, there are a lot of findings, and uh, we, always, we are still internalizing on how will be the best to make sure the results of that uh, process will be shared. So there are some gaps that as the program we, we, we saw, 
especially on uh, equality and non-discrimination. What? Okay, we saw those gaps on even practices and I mean latrine maintenance. Yes, it's good on when you look into access. I mean, when you look into the structures, yes, we, we, we performed well, but on the area which touches the hygiene practices and the maintenance, still there are some challenges which we still need to put on some effort. And also on the issue of menstrual hygiene management, also on the issue of water access and treatment, I know someone asked about water access and treatment. There was no correlation between the, I mean, the achievement on uh, access and the achievement on, on water, that was not. Also the, the issue of slippage because the level of ODF that we have, uh, the program has achieved is level two, which is the minimum. So still there are some slippage, slippage in terms of behavior and slippage in terms of structure, especially when heavy rainfall comes. So key lessons that the programs uh, have learned, one of it, it is the strategic institutional triggering. Uh, the program deals much with software implementation. So we learned that we still need to engage even non-wash actors to make sure every aspect is covered well and the techniques on behavior change as well is well, I mean is well uh, emphasized in the presence. Also to strengthen the reinforcement of evidence-based decision on the quality outcomes. So we use this, I mean, we are planning to use this in outcome findings as the basis for, I mean, seeking ad advocates and even for triggering much more of the engagement and the resource allocation to the local governments that we are working with and even to the national government as well. Also, we, we feel like we need to review much more on the hygiene and the social norms. I mean, our approaches when it comes to hygiene and social norms because uh, it is not uh, parallel to access achievements. So uh, also we are taking an opportunity or an advantage to the current national movement of sanitation, and, I mean, the national sanitation campaign which is led by the government and is in the picture you can see is the vice president wanting to know more on what the program is, I mean, is doing and in, I mean, what impact and uh, what result it, it, I mean, it add on the value to the existing national sanitation campaign. And that also have triggered the program to open its mind. Instead of focusing in our villages, we are now thinking of the district, the district-wide, the region, and so far to, uh, to work along with the country to have the national, the Tanzania ODF. So we, we are still also working on uh, organizing the team to, is, to do the strategic institutional triggering so that even the national will add, allocate much more funds to the sanitation as well. So because we said, uh, as, you, as you have seen, there was a gap on uh, social norms and practices. The quick action from the program, we did the direct community contacts, the DCC as we have engaged the musicians and we have the lo local radio. I mean, we use the media, the social media to make sure that the sanitation and hygiene is part of the thing and it increases awareness and changes the now and it focuses more on practices rather than only construction because we know the structure, if it's not used well, it's also the source of, of diseases. And I see materials uh, for marginalized group, especially the people with the with vision impairments, impairments, they have seen to have some challenges. And even though if you can look at district-wide, we have uh, reached the good access percentage, but during uh, asking or response, response from this group, it shows that at least 14% are still practicing OD because of being marginalized. So we, also th we are also thinking on the materials that can be helpful to those groups as well. And even involving the associations during the reflection and the review meetings that we are doing. So we are also working much on documentations 
and events so that it, uh, we can share the success story and the best practices to all of the WASH practitioner to change our approaches. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Sorry, before I go, <laughs> sorry, before I go, I, 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 there is this very nice part at the national level because whatever I've said, it is at, uh, in the ground and as the program. We also, as, because we are talking the monitoring here, we, are, we want also to support the national to review our monitoring system. We are using the national system and it is very strong and we are having the, the I mean, the national management information system, which is at national level, but it is not inclusive. So now, as the WASH partner and other stakeholders, we can review on how can we define the disadvantage and other key areas so that it can be incorporated to be able to measure everyone and also to review, to strengthen the collaboration with other partners at national level as well. And above all, to harmonize our national, I mean, our data collection system. We are having the National Bureau of Statistics, the district, I mean the national system. All of them are the national system, but when you look into the year data, sometimes they tell different information. So we call on harmonizing. So wherever the source, you'll get the same information. Thank you. Excellent. So we are starting to run out of time, and in fairness to the speakers on the panel, I'd like to just limit it to maybe two questions and hopefully short questions. For, uh, for Joyce, one or two questions for Joyce. I didn't get any from this side earlier. Any on this side? Sorry? Yeah, here, excellent, thank you. Maybe you could introduce yourself. I didn't yeah, uh, by introducing myself, uh, my name is uh, Jackson Mtazamba. I'm coming from the Minister of Water uh, here in Tanzania. Um, my question is a small one. Uh, from the presentation, uh, in terms of the data, especially people who are going to the field to collect the data, the numerators, you say the time was really limited. You had two days, and uh, this has uh, maybe in one way or another affected you, uh, the data you collected from the field and uh, could also trigger to or result into getting the information which is really do not, the information which does not uh, uh, reflect the real situation on the ground. Now, uh, have you tried to compare the data which you have with whatever maybe NBSC or the other actors who are in the field collecting the, the data so that at least you can see the consistency or the correlation, whether they are somehow correct? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the answer is, as I shared, like the survey report is still under review, so we have not yet finalized to be able to compare with other studies. But I was sharing as experience, the actual data collection was not two days anyway. The two days was for training the research assistant and getting them involved. The actual was two weeks. So. Uh, I just wanted to, I mean, as a lesson to other countries, when they are doing the training to their research assistant, to be able to, I mean, for them to be able to capture those information accordingly, to have allocated more time than, rather than two days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, one last burning question. To the first presenter. Can we hold it towards the, to the end? Because we will okay. kind of, sh okay. We will try to have time at the end for, for more questions. So can I ask the uh, panelists to come up? Um, Virginia, Rick is here someplace. Uh, Kefa, did Kefa come back? Ah, there you are, excellent, come. And um, Rick, there's one more. Oh, and Joyce, Joyce, you're on this panel as well. Yeah. So, 
Um, okay, good. We're, it's about 10 to 4, and uh, we need to end by 4.30, so we'd like to have uh, another 20 or 30 minutes with the panel and at least have 10 minutes left for, for additional questions at the end. Um, I'm uh, pleased to introduce um, uh, uh, the distinguished panels, and I'll just give your names and titles, and when we get to you, you can do further introduction, if you like. But we have um, uh, Kefa Ombacho, who is the Director of Public Health, Ministry of Health in Kenya. We have Virginia Rofe, who is a special consultant to the Sanitation and Water for All. Uh, we have Rick Johnson, who is part of the uh, WHO UNICEF Joint Monitoring Team with, you're the WHO part, correct? Yeah, and then we, you've already met um, Joyce Masil from uh, PLAN in Tanzania and part of the Collaborative Council Global Sanitation Fund program. So I am um, been asked um, to ask a couple of questions, that, again, focusing on, not necessarily related explicitly to the presentations, but to the general theme of, um, that I noted before, which was um, measuring the last smile and assessing new equity and sustainability data across African countries. So to some degree, um, Joyce's last comment is, is a good segue into this panel where we, we're really interested in understanding sort of the bigger picture at the national level and monitoring and monitoring in terms of really leaving no one behind and the equity issues and the sustainability issues. So um, let me put on my glasses so I can read my questions. Hold on one second. Bear with me. So I'd like to start with Kefa. Um, Kefa, the, the, the government of Kenya has made important progress, and I know that personally. I've been uh, working with you for many years, uh, building a sector-wide monitoring including the national CLTS database. Um, what, from your point of view, what are the next steps for measuring to taking that database to really begin to be able to measure equity? So, so are there anybody being left behind? And also the sustainability of the uh, ODF communities. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pressure for us to be here to address colleagues. Um, just Taking from my, the other colleagues who, who are presented uh, ahead of us, is that uh, from the onset, uh, any country we start with uh, trying to answer a few uh, uh, needs we, which are actually very specific uh, for the country, but of course uh, we also group with the, the global agreed uh, uh, common goals. So for us in Kenya, uh, what we have done is that uh, we have created a, a hub, uh, an information hub, which is actually shared by all stakeholders in the country. It doesn't matter whether you are in a private NGO government, but uh, the hub is um, <clears throat> within the Ministry of Health, and indeed, we have the staff who are actually answerable to me. Some are em employed by stakeholders or within, but uh, you will not really have. But the big issue is that uh, the policy allows us to work as a, as a group. So the data we collect is based on um, what initially we had as our intents. Remember, in Kenya, we aspired to have OD in 2013. Regrettably, we were not able to be there. So we set another new goal of 2020, and then working with um, uh, partners uh, like UA UNICEF, WSCC, others who are within uh, the country, we have been able to have a software and uh, this software, we have kept upgrading or introducing other targeted areas that we would want to collect the information. Now, in terms of uh, 
Uh, and of course, we have also run uh, from uh, GMP some of the things we have also copied from GMP, what needs to be done so that we have uh, customized within the country. And we share this information within the country. We also give feedback. We also support this with uh, a magazine. Now, recently as a country, we devolved. So what we are trying to do is that uh, since this system is nationally based and the information we tap is from the counties, we want to develop the same replica at the county level, but uh, linked to us. Now, what that means is that uh, if we want to get any fine data out of what we have collected, we can. It's just a question of manipulating the data we are having. But that doesn't mean that we, had, we don't have challenges. We also have some small challenges, which we handle every, every now and then. I think I want to just end it there. And yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just, I, I'd be able to like to go through and at least ask one question for each panel so we can go around again. But thank you very much. That was good. Sorry? Someone say anything? Okay. Okay, so let's move on to uh, Virginia. Uh, Virginia, could you uh, briefly, in either the two-minute version or the five-minute version, uh, describe the sanitation and water for all mutual accountability mechanism, and then specifically to what degree the kind of equity and sustainability data or insights that, we, that we're talking about today play a role in that at this point or not? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Virginia. Is it, is it? Okay. Um, so I'm Virginia Rofe. I work with the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership. Um, I hope all of you know what the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership is. Actually, uh, all of the people in this panel are members of the of the partnership and could probably talk as intelligently as I will now about the mutual accountability mechanism, or at least I hope so. Kefa certainly can. Um, SWA, for those of us who, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, is a global partnership, multi-stakeholder multi global partnership, um, which is looking to find ways of uh, supporting all partners, all multi-stakeholder partners, so that's including governments, civil society, uh, private sector, research and learning institutes, and development partners, to achieve the SDGs. So that's a very quick and broad definition of what the SWA partnership is. Um, as part of this work, we have uh, relaunched uh, what we are calling the mutual accountability mechanism. We previously had a, a commitments process but we were dissatisfied, we, we found that this uh, commitments process that we previously had was not fit for purpose for working with our partners for the SDGs. The SDGs have put a lot more demand on what is expected from countries and from development partners. And so what we're uh, initiating at the moment is called the mutual accountability mechanism and the, the mutual aspect is as important as the accountability aspect. Previously, we've always requested that governments make commitments and report on them. And what we're saying now is that each of us, regardless of the type of stakeholder that we are, have a role to play and a, a responsibility towards reaching the SDGs. And so the mutual accountability mechanism has been redesigned to allow each stakeholder to make commitments under this process, but also for those commitments to be tied very much more deeply within national processes and multi-stakeholder platforms that exist in the countries. And where those don't exist, SWA and partners is working to strengthen those platforms. I think that's the two and a half minute version. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think we'll be having a session on that one. The, in this, yes. The, on yeah. the, okay. Yes, I can make a quick plug for, the, for a session that we're having on the mutual accountability mechanism. For those who would like to know more, please either come and talk to me or uh, it's, at, it's outside of the conference, main conference on Friday, the 22nd of February. But as I say, please come and uh, 
speak to me and I will pass you on a flyer. Thank you. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, Rick, moving on to you, I have been a long time user of uh, JMP data, and I particularly appreciate it when you and your team can crunch the data and present it in very uh, intelligible forms, charts, that even I can understand, you know, what, what is you're saying. And I know for, and during the last five years or so that I recall at least, you've, you've done really terrific work, for example, on showing uh, access by um, wealth quintiles um, and other areas like that. So can you describe sort of what you, what the, in terms of the joint, global joint monitoring data for everyone, um, what kind of equity data is already re being reported on, and um, what you foresee, what's, what's in, the, uh, in the plan for the future? You guys are always coming up with new and creative yeah. ideas of showing the data and stuff. Sure, well, thanks for the kind words, Eddie. We, we do put a lot of work into the communication and the sharing of the data through our online portal and through our report, so it's, it's glad to hear that they're seen as um, easily understandable. That's the goal. So the JMP has always um, uh, tried to highlight not just um, statistics around use of facilities, uh, but also inequalities in use of facilities. And actually, we, we, we don't report on access to facilities. Um, we, most of our data come from household surveys where we ask people, what is the main kind of sanitation facility people in your household use? Um, they might be reporting incorrectly, but they're reporting on use, not on you know, some theoretical access to infrastructure. Uh, but, but always we've been reporting on differences between urban and rural areas. And then for maybe about the 10 years or so, we've been working on wealth quintiles, and we've improved the, the uh, methods that we use. And of course, the household surveys themselves are improving these, and there are more of them. So we're better able now to look at differences between the richest quintile and the poorest quintile, to do that separately in urban and rural areas. Um, spoiler alert, we've got um, a new report coming out in May and June, and we're going to be um, making public trends in wealth quintile analysis, which we haven't done you know, consistently through our, through our online data. But we're also looking at other kinds of stratifiers. Um, we have some, about 100 countries now, where we look at subnational um, you know, use of water and sanitation services. So it depends on a, what a uh, particular survey looks at. But many surveys will try and have enough samples to give statistically meaningful numbers for you know, some sub-regional, sub-national regions, six provinces, 20 districts, um, things like that. So we're, we're sharing those now. I'm interested in, th most of these surveys are done at the cluster level. They're cluster surveys, so you go to, I don't know, maybe um, uh, 400 clusters and you interview 20 households in each cluster. Well, we're also starting to look at the distribution, uh, especially of sanitation, within the cluster and to then get a measure of not only individual household level sanitation, but also community scale sanitation coverage at the cluster level. So we're using this also for some of the burden of disease analysis. We just came up with a, a global estimate of, of how many people live in communities where at least 75% of the people have basic sanitation. So it's kind of a complicated indicator, but it's trying to get at that community uh, sanitation coverage. So that's one of the things that we're working on, both how to calculate that and how to communicate that effectively so people could use that. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, maybe I could just add a, a slight plug. Um, and so as many of you might know, I formerly worked with WSP at the World Bank, and I know that they work very closely with you over the last couple of years and producing these WASH poverty diagnostics. So they use your data a lot. And where they did that kind of overlay that you're talking about, looking at a country, looking at the, at the different regions in the country, looking at not just poverty levels, but then access to sanitation levels, health issues. And based on that overlay of the different key indicators, it would allow then 
the government, the World Bank, and many other stakeholders to better target their interventions in a more effective way. And uh, I think there are about 10 of these now done in 10 different countries, and would encourage people to track those down. I think. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody here is from the World Bank to give the website, but it's on their website. But. Okay, so um, Joyce, you, you've given a, um, an excellent presentation already. You've, you've shared many of your thoughts, including the last one on uh, national level uh, monitoring. Um, what's your sense on sort of where would you like to see in Tanzania the issue of measuring really sustainability of ODF. We, you know, increasingly people are concerned about the sustainability of ODF status in communities, and at least anecdotally, it seems like the the poorest who haven't perhaps been able to build a more durable latrine are the most at risk of slippage. Uh, in terms of going back to open defecation as their latrines get filled or or washed away. Uh, what's, do you have a vision or any thoughts on how the kind of, um, I mean, the, the data you did there was a survey and whether these kinds of data collection can be more um, continual on a regular basis, led by the government to really focus on the issue of not just equity but sustainability. Thank you very much. Um, My view on measuring sustainability and equity, it should, uh, it should be simultaneous and continuous. I agree on that. But um, on the issue of improved access to the low people, maybe to the poverty level, considering the poverty, I appreciate my country movement uh, on access to latrines towards improvement, I mean imp improved latrines, and also to build the, the relationship with the community which is already there. So to use the existing uh, commitment and will of the community and on the government on supporting the very poor of poorest, and also while considering those uh, very poor people to have a systematic way of supporting those which need special uh, installation of uh, latrines according to mobility, something like that, so that in the end, this sustainability and this, uh, I mean, this latrines which is constructed for everyone, it can be accessible for all. So that's my, my point, that it's not just constructing the improved latrines, but considering or supporting the community how those uh, latrines can be accessible to all of, the, of them. So if, it, if the, I mean in their community there is someone with vision impairment, then the community will be I mean, harmonized or sensitization and advocacy on the best way to address the way of constructing that latrines that will accommodate the need of the other people as well. So in my country, that thing is already uh, there when we are doing the sensitization and even in common, we see the community taking actions to, the, to those who cannot build their own latrines, uh, using the youth who are I mean, offering the I mean, effort in kind. They are constructing the latrines for the old, I mean, the old people and even to, there have been some, some innovations on putting the rope so that even the people with vision impairment can, can access, but still there is a need, especially for those with mobility problems, because they are the ones in the survey which shows that they are still having challenges on accessing the latrines. So we feel like that uh, measuring sustainability and equity should not be out of measuring. You cannot just focus on sustainability and forget the last mile. So need, that needs to be very well considered and taken into action. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joyce. I, I'm going to take the liberty of being the chair to give one. I'll share another quick story. Is that uh, I just came from Ghana, where I learned that the government of Ghana has a uh, emerging national level 
sanitation um, um, monitoring system, I think, not, and that has been supported by UNICEF and Niles. I'm not going to ask you to explain it because we don't have time. But it, but uh, uh, they, it is um, co data collected by the government, by the district level environmental health officers. It's you know, it's it is digitized. It's becoming a real dynamic national level monitoring tool, not without its challenges, as all data systems have. But most importantly, the gut, from my perspective, the government looking at that data is seeing that communities that have become um, ODF and that have been certified as ODF still have the bottom 20% of the households in those communities who don't, more or less, who don't have access to more durable latrine. So the government has just come out with a new policy supported by all the stakeholders to provide subsidies to those bottom 20 in ODF communities. They're working with the private sector to develop much lower cost, durable latrines and working with them to get access to those latrines. So I, from my perspective, that's a really good example of a government getting the data and reaching the last mile and having real explicit policies and partnering with the, with the, with, with the private sector to produce results. So. I'm going to keep moving backwards the way we came and finish with Kefa. But so, so Rick, you mentioned no. Leave it with Rick. Yeah, Rick, you mentioned that. Um, <laughs> you, you you mentioned uh, that. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, you're going to be coming up and showing um, trends in uh, wealth quintiles in, in ec equity. I, but I'd like to focus a little bit more on the sustainability issue. And I, I've sometimes tried to figure that out from the uh, JMP data comparing to other years, like an increase in, in uh, ODF compared to few, future years. But I, I never know how valid that is because of population growth, et cetera. So is there, um, is there a way to do it now? Is that in the future to be able to monitor the, what, we, you know, col broadly called sustainability of those services, in this case, sustainability of that behavior. Yeah. Well, um, maybe. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, actually, sustainability is a real challenge, and I would say that's one of the limitations of the data sets that we work with. What you would really like to know is an individual household, you know, what happens to them, you know, after two years, after five years? Does their sanitation system keep working? Do they slip? And most of what we have are individual snapshots, so they're good for giving the broad picture, but not for tracking populations over time. Now, at the, at the national scale or the urban or the rural scale, yeah, we can talk about progress. But actually, I want to talk about something there that is another limitation of our method and the data that we draw on, is that they all have some statistical uncertainty to them. Any household survey, it'll have you know, plus or minus 2 or 3 percent, something like that, depending on how many households they interview. And usually, that's not a problem if you're kind of in the middle of the range. You're, if you want to know, you know 60 percent or 80 percent, it's not a big deal. But when you get to the last mile, then it becomes really important. And really, a household survey is not the best tool to identify the most marginalized populations, the ones who are really being left behind. Because some people are not captured by household surveys. Homeless people, nomadic people. So we're recognizing the limitations of our data sources and methods to say um, quantitatively, you know, something's been eliminated or that 100% of something has been achieved. So actually we're, we're, we're contemplating a switch in our reporting to talk about uh, nearly universal access and nearly eliminated to recognize that you know our data can't say you know if the regression line for Bangladesh says that zero per, that, that open defecation is at zero percent well we know that there are some pockets some some people um, who continue to practice open defecation so by calling it nearly eliminated we want to shift the questions to who are those last mile populations? How are you going to find out information about them because the household surveys aren't going to be the tool you need for them? And what are the interventions you're going to be used to improve services for those populations? Because again, those won't be the same interventions you necessarily use when you're, you're working at you know, the, the entire society scale. Very interesting, Rick. Thank you. 
Um, pass it on to, um, to, to uh, Virginia. Virginia, so I want to dig a little bit deeper in the uh, mutual accountability, uh, what is it? Mechanism. Mechanism, yes. And, and I get it that, uh, it, you know, in a, in a country, it's a government-led program, but with many actors and players, and all have to work together in a systematic way to achieve uh, the results. I, I think that's the way I would summarize kind of what you said. But in that, and I assume that um, sort of what the expected results will vary from country to country, but it, to what degree have you been able to see whether countries, as part of that accountability, are saying, yeah, we want to reach everybody, and this is how we're going to do it, and this is how we're going to monitor it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, the, as we know, the UN year this year is, is on Leave No One Behind, and that's what the UN uh, political forum right. will be, high-level political forum will be monitoring, is on Leave No One Behind. And so the sector ministers meeting that SWA is holding in April in Costa Rica this year um, is, a, is also focusing on Leave No One Behind and what we're asking for our partners to bring with them uh, to the meeting in Costa Rica are there plans for leave no one behind? And I think that uh, what we've seen from the presentation today is that often those people that are, that are being left behind are being left behind because we don't know who they are, because they're invisible. And I, I'd just like to draw attention to the very basic uh, situation we saw in Malawi where we're learning that girls within a household uh, are being left behind and there's that, that's invisible, invisible data, and it's certainly invisible in the data that, that JMP is able to gather because they're looking at a household which is looking at everybody within the household and making assumptions, and we can't afford to be making those assumptions. Um, and so what we're looking at with the mutual accountability mechanism and through this, uh, the multi-stakeholder nature of it is to be able to look a little bit, dig a little bit deeper in what government policy is about and what and, and how the government is responding to that. And then you know, we've got the CSOs, we've got research and learning institutions also looking at that data and saying, yes, but what about in these areas? And what about mm -hmm. uh, in those situations that, that, that actually we know about and that you're not doing enough about? And I'd just like to just pick on, up on language as well. That we, I, I prefer the language of leave no one behind, even if it is almost leaving no one behind, to talking about the last <laughs> mile. Because the last mile implies that we're waiting till the end, and we can't afford to do that if right. we are really serious about uh, reaching um, universal access. We have to look now, in the first mile, to uh, reaching the, most, the, the poorest, the most marginalized and vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. I want to push it, wait before you give it to Kefa, I just want to push it a little bit more, and, and, and to acknowledge that you and Katarina really, as an engineer, educated me on the whole concept of progressive equity and how we really need to work with those that are left out now at a much higher accelerated rate. So how do we work with the, achieve, reach the high, the harder parts, the high hanging fruit instead of the low hanging fruit. And I think we're still at the rhetoric stage and that's why I cited the, the Ghana example where they're putting concrete actions in, into doing that. But I wanted to ask you that um, as part of the SDGs, as, as you well know, a big focus is moving from counting infrastructure to sustainable services. So it's not enough that a hand pump is installed, but that it's what we want is to be working for five or 10 or 15 years. And I know that SWA also has sort of their institutional behaviors and collaborative behaviors. And have, have you guys given any more deep thought into, as part of these accountability mechanisms, really measuring whether these services, whether the institutions are set up, the systems are set up to sustain the services over time? Um, absolutely. I think that the, the, the collaborative behaviors of SWA are about how things are done. And we're also, again, together with, uh, with GLASS and, and with WHO, we're, looking, we, we're gathering the data to look at how countries are are improving particularly on, on their institutions. And I know that Kefa can talk in much more detail about the kind of processes that need to be put in place. And you can monitor those processes as, as well as you can monitor uh, the outcomes. And that is an essential part of ensuring that, that we get sustainability. And so the mutual accountability mechanism, it's not about achieving 
uh, outcomes, although you could make a commitment about outcomes such as open defecation free, it's also about building the right institutions, making sure that you've got the right human resources in place to actually deliver the services that have been identified as essential. And as part of this team, building the right monitoring systems. And that, that are well, as part of, the, again, part of the mutual uh, accountability yeah. mechanism is about strengthening the national review and monitoring processes so that they can monitor the, the, their own Great. Uh, their own commitments. And that may be, one of the commitments might just be, we are going to improve our monitoring and our review processes so that we can identify who's been left behind. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I think often those people are, are invisible and Thank that's you. why they've been left behind. Thank you. Great. So everybody's been really good with the timing. Kefa, I just, I, I feel I want to just leave you with, not ask you a question, but leave you with the last words uh, about what the panel has said, what you've heard and kind of create a situation for folks then to have time for some questions. Thank you very much. And uh, definitely, yes, because uh, my colleagues are looking around here, I'm the only person who works for the government. Eh? So uh, uh, let me start with uh, not leaving everybody uh, out. And again, repeat with the uh, MAM, Mutual Accountability Mechanism. What it, it calls governments is essentially what government is supposed to do, to be accountable and to their own commitments. Now, in trying to do this, I think there are quite a number of issues, and right in this discussion, we are discussing about sustainability, and I agree that sustainability will be a continuous process. Why? Because there are emerging issues. Let us, let us take an example of the presentation which has been take, given to us a few minutes ago about Ma Marawi and uh, the girls being left behind. Now, we must address that problem with some kind of innovation because maybe it's a culturally rooted issue that we cannot just move in and sort. So we must be innovative. So adding innovation, addressing emerging issues, and uh, mainstreaming issues of uh, sanit sanitation marketing are going to be very key and very critical. Uh, and uh, essentially, from uh, SWA, what is uh, envisaged is that countries are going to be able to be accountable to their own commitments. Because uh, the, the commitments the countries make are based on the needs within the country. Yeah, and if, true, the countries are actually have, uh, agreed and signed to those commitments, then you should be able to be accountable to that. And uh, this is actually the, the agenda uh, going forward in trying to keep the sanitation, this, uh, to sustain the gains and have uh, 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 open defecation free for countries, which will be a continual. In fact, that's where the business now starts. If we become open defecation free, then the business starts from there for us to be able to be even work more harder. I, I think it's doable. Uh, what we need to do is actually to do things uh, slightly different from what you've been doing. Uh, add a bit of uh, data because we cannot just uh, work and uh, do things just like that. And then we'll be informed and the things can be able to, to continue. And of course, also get worried about uh, subsidy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Caroline, can I ask you to come and sit here? And um, this is your opportunity to ask uh, anything you want. You can ask questions of any of the panelists about either the presentation before or what they've said, and um, or you might have your own comment. That's also okay. But we have ten minutes, so try to keep it short. Come back. Oh, oh sorry. Did I cut you off before? So yeah. you're ahead. You're, you're okay. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my. Okay. I'm Nets Annet. Uh, I'm from Ethiopia, UNICEF uh, of WASH officer. So my question is to the first presenter uh, about um, the the definition for improved uh, sanitation across countries. So you show us the 
that you get across countries, Tanzania, Malawi, and uh, Kenya. And uh, there are differences across countries. So is it the country-specific definitions you are using to, to, uh, to monitor or to record the data, or is the same across the countries so that we can see the comparison among countries? Because the different countries have different definitions for improved sun lottery. Thank you. I'd like to get one or two more, and uh, I think this one was for you, Caroline. Right? Okay. And so, who has not yet asked a question? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Merci. We'll try to get to everybody. Adisoda Agbedo Yajide, GSF Program Manager from Benin. Okay. Ma question is par rapport à Joyce. Quand elle parle des, des personnes les plus pauvres que le gouvernement soutient, je voudrais bien comprendre. Est-ce est -ce que à ces personnes, c'est le gouvernement met en place des ouvrages ou c'est la communauté qui met en place les ouvrages pour ces personnes? I apologize. I don't think our panel was ready for. Does anybody, can anybody translate that question or out loud so we can all hear it? Oh, sorry. Uh, so basically she was asking, uh, when you, you were describing at the end, Who was she asking? Sorry. Uh, she was asking Joyce, okay. when you were describing in your presentation about the government targeting that last 20%, uh, with, you, you were describing, actually it wasn't, it wasn't a question that, uh, that Eddie was asking you, about identifying that last mile and then additional support mechanisms from the government, what that looks like, what kind of support mechanisms are you, are you implying there? That's what she was asking. Okay, one more for this round. Somebody in the back. Oh, well, go ahead. Again, introduce yourself. Good afternoon once again. Um, my name is Atta Benson from the Civil Society Network in Nigeria. I just have a comment for Joyce with regards to um, the data collection where they had challenges. I think, I don't know if you did that, but in future, you, when doing them, um, before going to the field to use particular tools, you, I think such tools needed to have been tested before doing otherwise, because if that had been done, you probably wouldn't have um, encountered the challenge you had. In, in, I mean, in future, you test the data before you put them into use. And my second comment goes to, um, WHO, JNP. Um, to what extent do you carry national institutions along in, in your de in data collection? And have you had a situation where a national institution or a government disagreed with, your, with the data you provided? Great. Thank you. I know the answer to that last one is never. So why don't you guys answer those three questions? Four questions, and then we'll have another round. Well, I think we have time for more, another round. If you keep your answers short. On the definition. <laughs> so on the definition on improved sanitation. Uh, so the idea was that these tools are using the same, they're using basically the, the JMP service letters, letters uh, and descriptions, the same across countries. However, <laughs> people are people, and in different countries, they do look at a slab slightly differently and call it something else. So we are uh, encountering some issues, and that's also why I actually balked in my presentation uh, some of the data on improved versus safely managed together, because we are double checking um, that in their interpretations of the tools that we gave them and how, how people that went to the villages and were actually scoring against those were indeed scoring the same way. In terms of how we measure ODF across countries, we have as GSF taken the decision that we have a, a GSF definition, uh, which is the minimum level we would want all countries that we, or programs we support to adhere to. And if that is not the same or, or lower than what the country definition is to actually separate the monitoring. So we would report separately for Ethiopia, um, because um, we have two ways. So we, we can show, okay, this is if you, if you take the definitions as they are per country, so many people are living in ODF. If you take the definition as we said it, slightly less people are, because the difference would generally be in the quality of the latrine. Yeah, so 
Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the response from my sister. I don't know her name, but on the support mechanism. Yes, in my country right now, there is no systematic uh, way of supporting, like of identifying this is the household which need the support. Now the government will pour out this amount of money to make this household construct. There are different mechanisms in different communities. Depending on the way they have been triggered, the way they have been taken up, the action of making sure they are achieving the ODF. So in some of the communities, the uh, elder son, whether they are outside of the community, they are the one who are wholly responsible to support those areas, I mean, those households. And in some household, I mean, in some communities, it is the youth who are organized and they are supporting. So, uh, I brought this up, so it's not right to deny like these people are not there and they do not require support to make sure they have the improved latrines. But uh, maybe using the associations and even the way of uh, improving much more the way it is done now, because the support they're giving it ends up building the traditional latrines or the basic latrines, which when also the rain comes, it collapse. So uh, to avoid the coming and, and forth of this uh, action, though they are doing in mankind to make sure that your colleagues are not left behind, but still I it was a call to partners and even to the national government to think on how the best if they are, uh, we can support this and uh, make sure whenever the access they get, it will not be given again and again and again. That's one. And coming to my brother about testing of tools, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we didn't test these tools. We did test as the program uh, technical teams and uh, even to the support team. But it comes, I was speaking about the research assistants who are hired by the consulting firm, which is actually going to conduct this uh, data in the field. Yes, you orient them and they might see like they have uh, captured and understood the tools, but in actual way, when they go in the field, there should be some time to check, I mean, uh, the quality of what they're doing. Is that training uh, well manifested to their understanding so that the actual data collection of the exercise can continue? rather than believing on just the training and letting them go to the field. That was one of my emphasis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question about national, uh, the relationship between national and global monitoring. So I have three points around data sources, definitions, and methods. So first, on data sources, all of the data that the GMP uses are national data. They might be censuses, they might be household surveys, they might be administrative data coming from regulators. But in all cases, we find what we believe to be nationally representative data. We share it with the countries in a consultation, and if they say, that's a bad data point, don't use it, we don't use it. Or if they say, you're missing this other data point, you should use this, we use it. And especially the statistical office is the one who has the mandate to say what should count as national data for global reporting. Now sometimes the statistical office and the line ministries are not in good communication and the line ministry has some numbers that they think are national statistics, but maybe the statistical office wasn't involved in collecting them or doesn't, doesn't consider them as national statistics. So we defer to what the statistical office says. But the second and third points about definitions and methods well, our role as a global monitoring institution is to apply a consistent set of procedures, and that includes definitions. We use the terms improved, basic, and safely managed to mean very specific things, and we apply that to all countries in the same way. But of course, every country has its own national definitions of what um, their targets and service levels are, and sometimes they use the same words. In Tanzania, improved sanitation means something different than the global indicator. So in those cases, uh, the key to reconciliation is just understanding. You know, when you say improved sanitation, it means dot, dot, dot. And when the JMP says improved sanitation, it means, you know, 
something that might be different. And the third is on methods. Um, we take all of the available national data sources and put them in a regression so that we can come up with estimates for all years. Many countries prefer to use like one recent data point. The most reliable, most recent data point is the number for coverage. Um, and again, for national purposes, that's perfectly fine. But for global monitoring, and in order to be consistent and to have numbers for all years, for as many countries as possible, we have a regression method that we use and, and uh, apply consistently. So I think I'll, I'll stop it there. Great. Rick, can you just clarify on your one point here because of the issue of uh, country definitions versus global definitions. Um, so my recollection is that in the SDGs, the targets came with the definitions as well, and those are very comprehensive stakeholder consultations with all the <coughs> countries and stuff. I'm sure KEFA was part of many working groups to reach some global consensus on a common definition. Is that reasonably accurate? Or? Um, well, for the MDGs, um, I don't know, maybe KEFA could say how like the, the words around improved sanitation and water were developed, but for safely managed, that is definitely the case, and there were technical working groups that worked for several years to see what had worked well in the MDGs and what was missing and to come up with recommendations about indicators and definitions and that led to these you know basic and safely managed services indicators that we're using today. Which all the countries voted on in General Assembly. Oh and well the 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 there's this thing called the interagency expert group, which is not agencies, it's countries. It's statistical offices of countries who approve the, the monitoring system for the SDGs. So they're the ones who've, uh, right. who've signed thank off you. on this. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's now 4.30, and I think uh, many of you and myself have to go to other meetings, and I think there are people waiting to come in here. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions, but I hope that our panelists might be able to say a few minutes if you want to walk up and ask them specific questions. But Please join me in thanking them all and for the last.